Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. Very excited to be back with you with another episode with my friend, entrepreneur, and host of the Tack Room Talk podcast, Josie Young. My man, how are you doing? I'm great, man. How are you? Man, so good. Been looking forward to connecting and doing this with you. Um, you and I met a couple months back at one of Cardone's events and you know, it's, it's divine timing for lack of a better phrase. Sometimes you're right where you're supposed to be at the right moment and, and we take advantage of it and then we end up in this kind of situation. So I'm excited to not only share your journey and your story, but your mission with this audience, something I truly believe in, which we will get into a little bit, but starting what's one thing about you that I need to know in order to know who Josie is. You know, the people that really know me the most, um, know that I kind of tell it the way it is, you know, I, uh, sometimes my wife is like, you, could you have toned that down a little bit? <laughs> but you know, like I, I like people knowing where I stand, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't, I, I think in today's society, um, people are, you know, I hear that phrase, fake it till you make it. And I, I don't necessarily like that. I like. I like people knowing where I stand and I'm not a, I'm not a, an a-hole by, by any means, but you know, like, Hey, like I'm going to call somebody out if, if I don't agree with something. And, and that's the beauty about America is like, there's so many people that can have different views and stuff like that, but you know, people know where I stand in the aisle. And so I guess that's one thing to know about me. Yeah. I, honesty is my number one value. I believe in that over everything. Um, one of the things that I have learned in honesty is to have a little bit more compassion in the delivery. Uh, mm. let, let me say, I've probably burned a few bridges being honest in uh, in their more direct capacity. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's so important and, and I agree we live in a very strange world right now where I think people are afraid to tell the truth and, and I think that's really dangerous. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I always have loved and enjoyed about getting to do this podcast and sitting down with people like you is like. We get to tell the truth mm. and the truth isn't always like pretty man. No, the truth sucks sometimes and it hurts and it's not great, but at least it's real and you don't have to go to bed wondering. Yeah. There's one thing that I, I feel like is a God given talent for me though. Um, is that I feel like I can connect with a lot of different people. Um, that, it, that is, a, that is a strong point of mine that I've been blessed with. Um, is that. You know, no matter what front you stand on, I feel like there's at some level, there's a connection point with whoever it is on this earth. You know, I can connect with that person. And so I thank God for that talent. Um, not to say that we have to agree on everything, but at least we can, com we can compromise and come to a, a, uh, a viewpoint that we can respect each other's terms, if you will. Yeah. I, I don't think we have to agree on everything. No, that's, that's, that's what makes us, that's what makes this world beautiful is that, you know, you, if everybody agreed on one point strictly alone, this, this world would be extremely boring and yeah. it would, and it would, and it would nosedive. Yeah. Like you have to have direction on both sides that pulls it together for compromise. Yeah. There's equilibrium, right? The exactly. universe, universe is always seeking that. And yeah. I think that there's. You know, there are certain things I think unalienable that we can agree in. Um, let's not murder each other. That'd be f great. Let's stop killing each other. Let's stop yeah. hurting kids. Like, I think if we nail those two things, we'll probably be pretty good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's funny. I was having a conversation with a friend the other night and I was like, we live in such a divisive society right now where it's like, even if you voted for someone I didn't vote for, like, I'm supposed to hate you. Yeah. And to me, that's so nonsensical. We used to sit and have dinner with people who had opposite opinions. And it was like, we break bread, we talk about it. We don't have to take it beyond that. And now mm. it's just a different world. Where does that come from for you? I know you said you it, it feels God given, but I, I'd have to assume that that's got to be implanted and ingrained in you from, from childhood, from your parents, your community. Yeah. You know, I was raised in a very rural community, um, very small community in, in Southern Idaho. Um, my dad, uh, was, was raised in Utah and, and ultimately moved up to Southern Idaho. He, he rodeoed professionally, um, come from a very humble background, not a lot of money, um, kind of made his own path. And, and, and my dad excelled 
in the rodeo career. He was actually the first guy from the state of Utah to qualify for the national finals rodeo right here in Las Vegas, where they take wow. the top 15 guys in the world. And so, um, you know, he was, he, he, he paved the, he paved his own path in his own right, you know? And, uh, but you know, I still in the rodeo career, if you, if you've done any history there, it's, you know, there's fame, but there's not a lot of money if, the, if you will, you know, it's getting to be different now these days, the money is getting to be very, very good. But, uh, you know, my whole time growing up, like didn't have a lot of money. Um, very, very humble. Um, you know, rural community where a handshake meant something, you look somebody in the eyes and you tell them something, you better, you better step up to the plate and deliver, you know, on what you said. And people held you accountable for that. And, uh, if you broke a word with somebody like it, it was like taboo. Mm. And, um, you know, so, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, when I was, when I was younger, I'd, ha I'd have to, I'd have to feed animals before I went to school and, and come home right from school and, and, you know, take care of the animals again and, and stuff. So I wasn't playing video games and doing stuff like that. You know, like I just had this very hardworking, um, background that I was raised in and, uh, and your word meant something. And so, um, you know, but having my dad in the spotlight too, like he was, he was on stages, he was in front of thousands of people when he would win and, and being interviewed and my dad would bring me up, you know, like he'd be holding me in his arms every once in a while when he'd win these big events and, and, uh, and exposing me that to that stage, if you will, of being able to speak in front of people and stuff. And so I was never shy. You mm. know, like I always had that, I think, I, I thank my dad for that. You know, I thank my dad for actually putting me in those rooms and those stages where I was, I was being sculpted into being able to have conversation, being around, you know, the adult conversation and, and, uh, and just, uh, my upbringing was, was humble, but it was also in the spotlight a little bit too. Like it was kind of a little bit of bolt. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I just, from there, I just like, I had, I seen my own goals and ambitions being sculpted because I seen what my dad was doing. And so from there, I, I set my own dreams of wanting to go and do something big. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, it, it was, it was an awesome upbringing. I, I can't say that I had a, a, a bad upbringing. Like we were very, we were very tight on money, but I didn't know that, you mm. know? just because my parents always was like that comfort zone of like trying to make things feel good, you know? And, um, uh, and so I, you know, I, I was fortunate in that aspect. It wasn't until later in my career where I, I felt trials and tribulations, mm. you know? You know, and, what's interesting about that is like, they're inevitable, Oh, right? They're, they're coming, right? Well, whether or not you like it and, and, you know, it's funny because people will sometimes ask me, like, before we record, if they're mm -hmm. like, I didn't really have a bad childhood. I'm like, great. Like, this, yeah. that's not like, of course, this is a show about trauma and overcoming. And, but it's really about looking at triumph and looking at overcoming and looking at, you know, what does it take to become the person that you're capable of being? Yeah. And, and I think that, and I don't know, so I'm curious, I'm going to ask you a question here. Many people who grow up with, family members, parents specifically who are in some kind of a spotlight often feel like they're in a shadow. Is that something that you experienced? 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so my dad was always in the spotlight. I'll give you a little bit of my dad's, um, stats. My dad was, my dad qualified for the national finals rodeo 11 times. Um, just to give you guys some context on that. They only take the top 15 guys in the world to the national finals rodeo. And, uh, most people work their whole career to just get a qualification there. And he qualified 11 consecutive years. He's three times run up to world champ. Uh, he's won the circuit finals many a times. And, um, like basically it was like having Tiger Woods as a dad in the golf game, mm. you know, like I had a, I had a very good coach. Um, so it was inevitable. That's what I wanted to do. That's all I, that's all I knew was rodeo. I wanted to rodeo. And so when I started rodeoing, I had some success, but it was, 
it was it was a little tough like i i literally my dad rode bucking horses so like i don't know if many people that are listening to this really understand the events and rodeo but there's there's buck and horse riding events and there's bull riding events. Both are very, uh, what we call rough stock events. And they're very grueling, taxing, life-threatening events. I mean, they're, they're dangerous events. You're dealing with, uh, you know, animals that are 1500 pounds so that nobody's going to blow a whistle and tell them when to stop. Like if you get in a wreck, you got to get out of a wreck or you die, you know, and there's a lot of people that die in this event. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, thank God I had a good coach, but on the other hand too, I didn't really have a passion for riding rough stock events. I wanted to rope, which roping is known to be more, um, easier on your body and not as dangerous and stuff like that. But I had so much flack from my peers of like, man, your dad is, he is the best. He's like one of the best guys in the world. Why do you not want to do that event? And I kind of shake off. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm like going to do it and stuff. I ended up like doing it out of peer pressure to start, like, because everybody was like, dude, why are you not doing this? And so I started getting on some bucking horses and learning the craft a little bit. I had learned the craft because my dad, that was one of his occupations was teaching schools. He, people would pay for him to teach them how to do it. He'd bring in 50 people at a time, 25 people at a time. They're all paying 500 to a thousand bucks a crack for a weekend to come learn from him. And he would actually use me as a, as a, um, as a template for the dummies that we had, like, uh, you know, a Bella Hay or, a uh, uh, you know, a hardwood, um, dummy that we use me for like, bo like explaining body, um, posture and how to get the right holts with your feet and all this stuff. So I knew how to do the event, but I was just like, I didn't really have a passion for it. Right. So I started, I started doing it out of peer pressure. You know, it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but so many people were giving me crap for not doing it because of who my dad was. I started doing it. And that was a time that was very daunting to me. Like I was like, it was scary because it wasn't something I was very passionate about, but I was only doing it because somebody else thought I should do it, you know? Mm. And I think there's a lot of people in this, in the world today that do that kind of stuff, whether it doesn't matter what field they're in, they kind of get pushed in a direction that people want them to do. Now I'm not regretting doing that, but after doing it for some time, I started figuring things out. Once I started figuring things out, I started becoming better at the craft. And then I started getting more intentional about the craft. I was like, you know what? I really can do this. So it was something that changed in my brain. Like, Hey, <clears throat> maybe, maybe you can do this because before I was doubting myself, but now I'm like, dude, you can, you can actually do this. I was, I was little. When I was, I was 13 years old when I started getting on, on my first bucking horses, I probably weighed 85, 90 pounds soaking wet. Like I was little and that was little for that craft. And, uh, my dad did take care of me though. Like he, he put me on livestock that would, you know, wasn't going to be like too much for me and, you know, sculpted me and stuff. And then once I started figuring things out. I started enjoying it. I started like liking it. And then I started getting intentional about it, right? Like, in, I'm, I'm probably going to use the word intentional a lot today because it's such an important word. Because I think that any success that you gain in life has to come from the word intentional. No matter what. Yeah. Like, I, you have to be intentional about stuff. I, I agree with that entirely. Intention is like such an important word. And... When I go look at my life, when I was a kid, intention for me was survive, like period. It was mm -hmm. like, be out in these streets if you have to, sell drugs, run with guns, get shot at by the cops, do whatever you have to do, but the intention is survive. Yeah. And that worked really well for me because I knew at least I was heading in a direction until of course it stopped working really well for me. And it, yeah. it not working well for me is 
you know, looking at my life and my environment, not graduating high school, family in prison for life, losing my three best friends and just being like, this is insane. I have, here's the thing, Josie, I don't think people really sit in because they're afraid of it. It's the truth. We're talking about honesty here. Mm. And the truth is a lot of times you put yourself in this situation. Yeah. I'm not saying you're culpable, like, you know, not knowing that you're poor as a kid and yeah. dealing with things of peer pressure. Like you don't know you're 13, you don't know anything. Mm. Right. And you're foolish to think that you do. And if you do, you're probably like me and everyone doesn't like you because you're arrogant and stubborn. Which may possibly still be true, Josie. I'm not saying that it's not. But, <laughs> yeah. But, but what I am saying is like, now I look at intention through this scope of like, it is arguably one of the most important words in the, in the entire world when you understand the role that it plays in your life. When, when you go back and you look at that, those moments and those experience of not wanting to do it, falling under the peer pressure, like, was this pressure from your father too? Or was it just the community and you felt like, man, I want to live into being this thing that maybe you didn't see, but other people saw in you? You know, I will say that my dad was always um, supportive of whatever I wanted to do. He never pressured me into doing that. It was more so community pressure in that instant, instance. Um, you know, my, my parents uh, were very, my, both my parents are very hardworking people. Um, my dad still to this day is the hardest working person that I, that I know. Um, with that being said, um, I, th I feel like he can work smarter mm -hmm. <laughs> in some instances, sure. you know? And so that's where it's coming full circle is I'm able to learn this stuff from my entrepreneurship and like the connections that I've made to kind of relay the message to him of how to make things easier in his older age. But at that point in time, you know, my parents was were willing to do whatever it took. You know, I paid, I played baseball. I played, um, football, um, you know, played a little bit of basketball and they were willing to take me anywhere I wanted to go. But it's like, you know, we had limited funds to do that. So we, you know, like I remember in the rodeo career, like, like there's people that, uh, it's, it's expensive to rodeo because you got livestock, right? You've got equipment and stuff like that. It's not like, if you want to go play basketball, go buy a basketball and some sneakers and some shorts and stuff like that and try to find a crew to hang out with and learn from and then work your way up the ladder. Like rodeo, it's like, I mean, a bareback rigging costs 500 bucks. Shaps cost, well, I just bought my, <laughs> it's different now. My, I just bought my son a new pair of shaps and that cost $2,500. Holy crap. I mean, it's ridiculous <laughs> just for a pair of shaps. A vest is 500 bucks. Like just, and the stuff that try to like keep them somewhat safe yeah it's like stuff that you need but they were willing to do whatever it took you know um i remember when i was rodeo and i was uh i was uh 13 years old and i was at a rodeo in shoshone idaho that my parents took me to and um i i actually got hurt in the i wasn't riding bulls yet or anything i was riding steers and they had some wild steers there and i actually got bucked off and and, uh, the, the steer hit me with his head in the, in the side when I was coming off and I broke <clears throat> at the time it happened so quickly. You couldn't see it. You didn't know what happened. Um, like if we've got it on video actually still this day, but, um, it just happened so quickly. You didn't really know. And I come from a tough background. My dad was raised very tough and my dad, you know, he said, you know, I said, man, I'm, I'm hurt. And, uh, and he says, well, he says, toughen up. He says, you got, you got a couple more events to work today. He's like, gather your stuff up. Let's go. And I was on the back of the, the buck and shoots and, and I was, I couldn't get my air. And I was, mm. I was, man, I had the worst side ache I've ever had in my life. And I put my gear away. I mean, I'm 13 years old, right? I'm putting my gear away and, and, uh, you know, I just, it just felt like I could not get my air and like, I'm starting to like. I'm starting to like feel dizzy and, and I, I, I was afraid to tell my dad that, um, that I didn't want to do any more events. Like I, like I'm done for the day. And, uh, you know, my dad was raised tough, tough. And so immediately that background of his was coming through with me a little bit. I think with every generation, it gets a little lighter, you know, mm -hmm. they lighten up a little bit, but I was, he was still raised very tough. So I was getting some of that too. And, and he says, he says, you know, get, he says, let's go. He's like, get, get your horse saddled. Like, let's go. You got a rope here in a little bit. Uh, I, I told my mom, I was like, I'm, 
like, I don't feel very good, mom. And she ended up having a conversation with my dad and, and there's a little fight, you know, like mama bear was like telling dad, like, no, it's done. Like, let's go home. And of course my dad was upset and, and, uh, we gather the horses up and we're headed back home and I'm laying in the back seat and I just had the worst, I had the worst side ache I've ever had in my life. And I start feeling lightheaded and, and, uh, my, my mouth was getting, you know, uh, dry and, and, uh, my mom was getting nervous and her, her sister was a nurse and an ER nurse here in Las Vegas, actually. So we live up in Idaho. My mom's from Las Vegas. So all of her family lives in Las Vegas. She called her, her mom or her sister on the way back to our house and, uh, told her what happened and kind of telling the symptoms of what was going on. And she says, you need to get him to the hospital immediately. Mm. And, uh, she, she says, what does he look like? And I, and my dad and my mom looked in the back seat and I was just pale as I could be. My eyes were rolling back in my head and I was about to pass out <laughs> and they took me to the ER and I had broke three ribs and I'd run one of my ribs through my spleen oh, and wow. completely ruptured my spleen and I was bleeding out internally. Holy. Yeah. And I like the, the doctors immediately. Should took, toughen up, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, that's just the way I was raised. That's yeah, the way yeah. we was all raised, you know, in that, that area. And so. Um, the doctor said, man, if you'd have been here 30 minutes later, you, he had been dead. Like he had lost so much blood that That's it wild. was just, you know, so from a young age, like I started gaining that, that pain threshold, Yeah, you know, and that, that grit, you know, and, uh, I spent a week in the hospital there and, uh, they took half my spleen out on the other note, my, they were going to take my, my whole spleen out, but my, my parents, my, my dad was the one that, uh, was started the company that I'm in right now. And it's a health business. My grandma was a nature path for people. And so he always questioned the doctors when everything was going on, you know, and they were going to take my whole spleen out. And my dad actually started asking the questions and they was able, he says, well, what if you just took the half out that was, that was damaged Would the other half still work? And they're like, well, yeah, I guess it would. And so he ended up ha actually saving the half that the doctors were going to take out. So Fortunate, like it, I, I was glad that my dad was there to actually, you know, have the balls to say, to question the doctors on this deal because they're going to take my whole spleen out. But now I still have a half a spleen, which actually works as good as my whole spleen. Yeah. You know, so it's like a catch 22 yeah, there a little it's bit, wild, man. but that was my first experience with, with, um, you know, adversity and in, in, in that industry. Yeah. You know, it makes me think. I remember I had this high school football coach and he would always ask us this question. He'd be like, are you hurt or are you injured? Yeah. And man, uh, in all fairness, like I don't have children. I will never let them play football. Like if yeah. I do never, because dude, I put, I remember one time I was playing and it was our senior homecoming game. We were getting stomped. My friend Sam played for the opposing team, ended up winning a state championship. And Sam, to this day, I still talk to me. I love this guy. Smokes me, blindsides me. <laughs> like, dude, I, and I'm seeing stars. I'm upside down. I'm like about to throw up in my mouth. 100% all the signs for a concussion, right? Yeah. Come out of the play, come out of the game for one play, get some water. Coach goes, are you hurt? Are you injured? Mm. I go, I don't even know what day it is, dude. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. And we go right back into the game. I finished that game and I mean who knows how many injuries, concussions, broken yeah. fingers, you know, broken feet, toes, the whole nine. And it's like, you know, there's interesting you say that because there's something about that. I don't know what it is, but there's something about having that grit to, yeah. to tough through that physical pain yeah. that it changes you. Like, I don't know what it is and I don't wish it on people. I don't want people to get hurt. Like it sucks. I mean, you know, it happens all the time where humans were going to get hurt, but there's something that creates resiliency in you. It's engaging a piece of your mind that you've never engaged before. I truly believe that. There's a lot of people in this world that have never had to go to that depth, you know? Um, it's, it's crazy, you know, like, I don't know what it is. Like, uh, I have a lot of friends that are, I've never been in the military, 
but I have like a lot of friends that are ex-military guys. And it's just like, they're like, dude, like, and I, they're, they're like, you're one of the guys that we connect with that has never been in the military. And I think it's some of the same mindset is because like, like if you're out in war and you're getting shot at, or you're, you know, like you, you get an injury, like you can't just be like, Hey, time out. Like I'm going to get off the field. Like you got to finish a job. Right. And the same in rodeo, like if, if you get hurt and you're in the middle of a war or you're in the middle of a fight, nobody blows a whistle and says, Hey, everybody stop. Like you got to get out of the fight <laughs> before you get some relief, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's kind of the same mindset a little bit. Um, but it, that was one of the first things that sculpted me, you know, um, I had a, in high school, I was riding bucking horses and I had a horse, pa uh, throw me past my rig and and broke my wrist off and my hand didn't come out of my rig and it wrapped my arm around my rig and I was stuck to him. Is the rig the thing you hold the on to? Like so, you put your hand underneath yeah, it? Yeah. So, and, and they're fitted to our hands. So they're, they're tight, you know, it's hard to get them out. Right. And so I broke my wrist off there and, uh, you know, I ended up coming back the next day and roping. I had a cast on and, and I put the reins in my, my horse's reins through the crotch of my arm and come back and I just figured it out. You know, yeah. I was like, man, I'm not going to not rope. I can't ride bucking horses, but I'm going to rope, Yeah. you know, and it's just that mindset of like figuring stuff out. And then, um, that was like the first things that come like these little injuries along the way is, is what creates the mindset of, of fortification for, for business yeah. of figuring out. And it's not just, here's what's so interesting. It's not even just the physical injuries. Yeah. It's the mental injuries. It's mental it's 100%. The, I got third place, even though I worked my face off. The, the thing that I'd been working for the last six months just crashed and burned. Mm. Can't make payroll. Had to let go of the whole team. Closed the business. Got the debtors on the line. The, they repoed the car. Like I'm, all these things have happened to me, right? Yeah. I'm just like, okay, now what? And, and I think that a big thing that I love talking about on this show is resiliency. Mm. I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan. I don't think people understand how big of a fan of Kobe Bryant I am. And one of my favorite quotes of all time is he goes, winning is everything. And, and it like, it sits in my soul when I think about that, because you have an opportunity in life to go and create everything you want, man. It's like right here, but we have so many reasons, so many excuses that we can leverage. And dude, mm -hmm. most of your excuses are totally valid. I will never take anyone's excuse from them. The people could look at you and go, man, that guy's dad was really hard on him. You know, that guy's mom was really hard on him. His community is really hard on him. And I'm not saying those things aren't true, but I am saying like, there's something about, and this isn't, let's be clear. This isn't like boys don't cry. This isn't man up. This is like life is on the other side of hard decisions. Mm. And I'm curious, what do you think is the most important lesson that your parents taught you? Um, finish what you start, you know, like, I, I feel like, I feel like finishing the job is, is such a big thing, like completing the cycle. You know, my dad's such a good, uh, a huge testament of that these days. I feel like, you know, there, a, a person can get caught up in like having these big ideas and starting something and then like, you know, having something like halfway done and then moving on to the next thing. You know, my dad is, and, and my mom both, like when they start something, they finish it. Yeah. When they tell somebody they're going to do something, they do it. So important. You know, and it's like, I, I really feel like that is so important. Like I heard Brandon say this again again the other day and it resonated so i you know like brandon dawson with cardone ventures he's a huge mentor of mine business mentor and he's become a, a great friend of mine and he said this uh, a couple weeks ago in miami when i was around him of completing the cycle like that is like that's that's everything like if you put something in your mind obviously it's in your mind for a reason you're passionate about it complete the cycle, see it through. And guess what? If you, if you do that, if you do that with everything you do and you, and you start running out of time in the day and you're like, what does that make you do? It makes you get intentional 
about what you start. Because so many people start all these things, right? Okay, you start all these things and you, and you finish the cycle. Now your day becomes filled up with all this stuff. Now the things that you start, you, you better be intentional about what it is that you start. Right now, that's where real progress happens because coming back to the word intentional is be intentional about the things that you pick to start. And once mm. you start them, then finish them. Finish them. That's so important. That is not a lesson I learned in childhood. You yeah. know, it was this thing where I was all, dude, just constantly all over the place. And then you factor in growing up in the streets, not having a, a male role model of any capacity around me. Mm except violence and drunks. Right. And so I was just like going from thing to thing, to thing, to thing, to thing, constantly you include friends, women, cars, clothes, the whole nine. It was just like, what's next, what's next, what's next. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got some clarity and I was like, okay, wait a second. What do I actually want? Can I make that the marker? Can I move towards that aggressively? Can I, can I know that on a long enough timeline? I believe that if I don't give up, I'll like bring it to fruition. A lot of that was healing. Like being able to sit down and have real conversations, mm -hmm. be honest, not lie. Don't hurt people. Don't still don't, you know, just literally reframing so much of it because what I was shown as a definition of, of manhood is what you see in movies, like almost to a T. Yeah. Right. And it's a abandoned father. He's not there. Drug addict mother. She's not there growing up on the streets. My, my boys are my community, right? They're getting locked up. We're getting shot at. I'm selling drugs because I don't know better. So I get kicked out of high school the whole nine. And then it was like failure after failure, after failure, after failure. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until I was like, I'm going to define who I am as a man. And I'm going to go in this opposite direction that, that things started to change. And a big part of it for me was just learning how to be emotional, learning how to be a man, learning how to take care of things, learning how to cross the finish line, complete the circle, the cycle, mm. right? I'd be remiss not to ask this question. I think it's really important, especially for people listening. Growing up in this tough guy environment with a, a and sounds like an incredible father, driven, probably pushed you in ways that you don't even understand to this day, right? Yeah. In the, in, the, in the lights, having this powerful mother in this environment that just in some capacities, probably like my environment spewed toxicity about what it meant to be a man. What did you understand about manhood as a kid that you don't believe today? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, you know, being, being vulnerable. Um, I, I struggle with that today. You know, I, I feel like it's okay to open up and, uh, and tell your inner circle how you really feel. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be your inner circle. It can be, it can be anybody because like, listen, like people resonate off of failures. They don't resonate off of wins. Mm. You know, so like it, true. it hits home with people when they see other people fail, because in today's society, like whether it be social media, whether it be, um, people talking on stages, whatever it is, everybody talks about winning. Oh, my marriage is so great. You know, this and that, like, look at us, you know, like we never have any problems, you know, like, like anybody that says that they don't have any problems with, you know, their marriage or their um, family life, I, I say problems, struggles, sure. struggles is sure. a better word. Um, you know, um, somebody that wins 100% of the time, that is complete. Like people resonate with failures. I share with my team in my business about my failures in my past because they get it. Like I, I, I want to share with them my journey on, on where I got to where I was and what failures I had to go through. And, you know, um, you know, I, I was always taught, you know, be tough, you know, always win stuff like that. Um, you know, don't show your weakness, you know, things like that. And man, man you yeah. know, like, but it's okay. Like, Hey, guess what? I've cried before. Like I've shed tears. I don't do it very often. I don't do it in front of a lot of people, but Hey, it happens, you know? 
Um, and I've lost, I've lost a lot, but it's in my losses that I've, that I've gained more knowledge, way more knowledge because, you know, um, I was fortunate enough last year to go and sit in the same room as John C. Maxwell, mm, he's which amazing human. John is, um, one of the guys I started following through Brandon because John is one of Brandon's mentors. And now John has become one of those, uh, mentors that I follow and want to take into my, my life and, and exemplify that in some way. And he shared the, he shared in front of my crowd, it was a very tight knit group of probably 30 or 40 people, his talk on ROF. Everybody talks about ROI in business, return on investment. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I don't know this acronym, this ROF acronym, all these acronyms in business that we learn. I don't know what ROF is. And it turns out that nobody else in that room knew what ROF meant either until he told us it's return on failure. Mm, the greatest gift. It's the greatest gift. I mean, if you can, you know, going back to what Brandon teaches, you know, first you have to acknowledge the failure, accept it. And then you have to act on fixing that and then put a tax speed behind it. Right. And so that's where real growth happens. And so I would say in today's world, it's okay to, to be vulnerable and to really look at yourself. Like as, as far as a man goes, I mean, I'm a man's man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gritty dude, you know, like I'll be in the trenches. Like if, if one of my buddies, you know, needs me like life or death, man, I'm there. I'm a gritty guy, but it's okay to be vulnerable. You know, it's okay to admit your failures. It's okay because like, really that's where we all grow. Like you have to acknowledge it. You have to, if you don't, you're going to be stuck in your same egotistical way and you're going to be complacent and stuck the rest of your life. My thought in real time is like, if a cowboy is telling me to be vulnerable, like what the fuck else do you need to know? <laughs> yeah. You there know? You go. And, but I, but I get it. And you know, so much of it for me has been that there are people who I knew 10 years, 15 years, mm. almost 20 years, even a handful of people who knew nothing about me. They didn't know about the pain. They didn't know about the suffering, the abuse, the homelessness, the drugs, the, the putting myself 50 grand in debt, the getting the truck repo, the car repo, excuse me. Like they just didn't know. Yeah. And I kept it silent and man, that ate me alive. You know, there are certain things that they will, the body holds on to these memories, these emotions, these experiences. The, the hardest thing that I've ever had to do was around men and manhood specifically. When I was 30, I forced myself into what I would call to this day, the most uncomfortable situation I've ever been in. And it was walking into a men's circle where there were six of us every Wednesday talking about emotions mm. dude it was gnarly because i had to take all that out of my head yeah about what it meant that word vulnerability did not exist in my vocabulary and yeah. my nomenclature in any capacity until i'm sitting in this room with these guys and i made the decision to do this because i remember one day i was sitting i was like i have no real relationships with men yeah never been around a father my stepdad's a piece of the only guys I ever hang out with are they're drinking and partying and their way through life. They're yeah. chasing money and girls and cars and clothes. This is a reflection of my life. There's got to be something different here. Mm -hmm. And that vulnerability element, man, that was a game changer. Yeah. Game changer. And so I, I really love that you said that. Well, I think a guy has to exercise it too. You know, I mean, I, I, I feel like that's probably something that's, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. That's, that's something that I struggle with, like doing it more. Like I need to exercise it more. I, I like to dive into these things and I like talking about them thing, these things, because it reminds me of what I need to do more of, you know? Um, but you asked the question, right. And yeah. it reminds me, it's like, yeah, you know, that's, it's okay to be vulnerable. And, uh, and, and that's something I want to put out there to the world right now. I was like, man, I'm, I'm not a perfect guy by any means. Like I am one of the most least perfect dudes <laughs> on this planet me but, too you know it's like man if you can take a step in the direction like it just be a be a, a percent better in this direction 
like as long as you don't go the other way making progress yeah right and, and and inevitably you will go the other way yeah and i think that's just a part of the game complacency you you said something that that sparked a memory you know i've been fortunate enough to have uh tom bill you be in my life as a mentor for a very long time and, mm-hmm. and he talks about failure quite frequently yeah and and he said something one day that just it got implanted in my brain and it actually one of the things that happened when he said this to me it was it kind of gave me a little bit of permission he goes failure is the most data rich stream of information on planet earth and mm-hmm. you speaking about john maxwell who i've luckily also had the the privilege of being in rooms with and, and learning from you talked about failure and sharing it with your team what is one of the failures that you've had in your life that transformed you that has led you to where you are today? You know, I mean, I've had many failures in my life. Um, you know, when we go back to my professional career, you know, I, I had worked so hard to, you know, when I started, um, you know, I got full ride scholarships to go to any college I really wanted. I could have went to some better colleges if my grades had been better. (laughs) So that's a failure for sure is my grades, but, um, I didn't apply myself. I wasn't intentional. I was, I'm a very smart guy. It's just like, where do you want to put your intentions? Right. And I went, I went and rodeoed at college for a couple of years, but, um, ultimately decided I wanted to go to the professional ranks and, and, and make a career out of rodeoing. So I went and did that. And, you know, I rodeoed for a couple of years and, and didn't make the national finals rodeo. I'd had some success on the circuit level, but you know, when I finally made the national finals rodeo, like here in Las Vegas, I was, I was one of the top 15 guys in the world qualified for the national finals rodeo. I'm like 25 years old, young cat, single, like, you know, I mean, I'm living life large, right? Like, this is awesome. I'm sponsored by Mirage. I'm like, you know, hosted an after party with uh, Lady Gaga, like, you know, just freaking living the life, right? I qualify for the Nas- National Finals Rodeo, the very first, the ver- it's 10 go-rounds, the very first go-round I break my pelvis. Mm. I'm like, whoo, you want to talk about bringing me down to freaking level? I was like, golly. Well, I actually ended up, I was talking to the doctors, I says, hey, I says, uh, you know, am I done? And they said, well, they said, you're not going to hurt it any worse. They said, but it's obviously probably pretty painful. I said, yeah, it hurts. I says, uh, can I still ride? And they said, well, you're not going to screw it up anymore. But they said, if you can handle the pain, I end up riding five more go rounds with a broken pelvis. You know, you're talking about riding bucking horses. Like this is a very physical event. <laughs> and, uh, I rode five more go rounds cause I come in number five in the world. I had a shot to win the world that year. And, uh, so I kind of put it out there on the line and that, that felt like a big failure to me to like throw in the towel. Like that was tough for me. Like this is something a little kid dreams of from the time he's a, you know, born that he knows anything about rodeo to qual. It's like qualifying for the Super Bowl If you're a football player, like getting that Super Bowl ring. Right. And it was just like, it crushed me. Like I literally like stayed in my room for two days straight. Didn't even go to the performances like canceled all my autograph signings. Like I just felt like I just let the world down. I was the only guy from the state of Idaho that had qualified. I felt like I, lo- I let my state down, you know, everybody had put money on me, betting on me, you know, and it was tough, man. Like I freaking felt, oh. I, it brought me down the size. I was kind of halfway choking up right now because it was just like crap. But that's a materialistic thing. You know, that's something that I, I kind of got to thinking about. I was like, you know, the, there's a purpose for this happening. You know, this is, a, this is a failure, but what is the reason for this? And I end up coming back from that the next year, you know, I, I had to sit out about six months and, uh, I end up finishing the next year out, kind of getting some practice, feeling good. I come back the, the first of next year, feeling great. I'm in the top 10 in the world going after it. I'm like, all right, it's my year. We're going to get back to the national finals royal. Let's do this. Um, I went to Yuma, Arizona, getting ready to go to a big tour rodeo in San Antonio. I was going to go down there and practice at this rodeo. I go down there. I win the rodeo after the whistle, a uh, horse tried to jump a fence with me and I, I got off of him, like trying to stay out of a wreck and cracked the front of my shin on a piece of solid pipe and 
tib fib break broke my leg off in yuma arizona mm. stuck a rod and four screws in that i'm done for the year again i'm like holy crap oh my gosh here we go you know like trying to hype myself up get past this failure you know like this is like mentally taxing on me like and i'm trying to stay positive i'm trying to like keep myself upbeat <clears throat> okay so i come back the next year having a great year <laughs> um july comes around i'm in the top 20 in the world doing great feeling good my legs healed up go to press uh preston idaho on my way to cheyenne um and uh had a horse run me down the gate hook my toe in the slat my left leg and trapped it and broke my left leg off i just got healed up from my right leg and my pelvis and you want to talk about right then and there it was like it like i literally felt like god was like no you ain't doing this like you you like I didn't even know if God existed at that point in time. I had prayed so much. I was trying to do things right. I was trying to do things. I was like, what is the freaking message here? Like, I, I was so lost. I was like, Jesus. Like, I went to a low spot. Like, got, like, just max credit cards out. You know, I had no way of making an income because I'm freaking crippled. Like, just got, like, broke in debt and just really didn't know what, what the you know, but at that point in time, I was, uh, it allowed me to, to be at home and it allowed me to, to like kind of sit back. I, I gained a relationship with my now wife, you know, was able to, cause I, I would go to a hundred rodeos a year all over the country. Right. Like, I mean, you, you think about that hundred rodeos a year in 365 days. That's, that's a lot of traveling from East coast, West coast, Canada all over. And, uh, so I was able to like kind of relax and gain that relationship and, and actually start a family, but I was also able to like start diving into the family business a little bit. And I feel like, you know, like there's things that are presented to you that you're not really aware of at the time, but if things happen to you in your life, you got to sit back and you got, you got to be like, you really got to assess that. Hey, why is this happening? Especially when you're trying to do stuff right. When you're trying to like, like, hey, maybe this ain't the path that you're supposed to be on, right? What is the path that I'm like that really is intended for me? Because we all have a we all have a, a plan for us. I firmly believe that every single person that's put on this planet has a plan. You know, like what is that plan? We we're not just like here's the blueprint. Like it's up to us to find that path. And, uh, and I, and I did, I found that path. I was able to kind of start diving into the business and, and now I have a beautiful wife and two children that I love dearly. And, and, and now I own, I own the business that I started diving into. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that old Tony Robbins thing, right? Life's happening for you, not to you. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to reconcile, man. It's so difficult because yeah. it, it feels like when failures start mounting, it feels like the world is against you. And I'm not saying it's not because dude, life is hard sometimes. Dude, you're in, you're, you're sitting in this moment and, um, you know, for me, I remember dead set exactly where I was. I'm, I'm sitting in my bed and it's 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm at that time, 350 pounds. Yeah. I'm chain smoking cigarettes, drinking, getting stoned. And I'm watching CrossFit games, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and I'm just yeah. like, I'm like, what is happening? Uh, yeah. My car had just got repoed. Yeah. You know, I had an $80,000 Cadillac. I'm 50 grand in debt. I had made a million dollars. You know, my little brother says to me, don't talk to me. He literally just called you. Know, I call him one day. I was just trying to connect. I hadn't talked to him in a while. He goes, dude, you're not my brother. You've never been around. Leave me alone. Don't talk to me. And it was just like, why does this keep happening? Yeah. Why every single time I'm like, I'm trying to do things right. It's like, wait a second. Maybe I'm in my own way. Mm. I remember I was in, I was in Indonesia living down there for a bit, a couple of years back. Like and, just off a whim. Yeah. <laughs> like, do they, yeah. I'll just go to Indonesia. I, well, I was in, I, I lived in all over South, uh, Southeast Asia for a couple of okay. years, lived in South America for a while. And 
you know, just being adventurous, going yeah. for it and seeing what's out there. And then I remember one time I was sitting on the beach and it was like, I heard this voice in my head, like not in a crazy way, but like in a, like pay attention. It was like, you need to leave this place. It was like energy. You know what mm. I'm saying? There's energy. And I did it. And the next day I'm in cross the irony, right? I'm doing CrossFit because it became a huge part of my life for a long time. And, and I, because I wasn't paying attention, slipped and tore my MCL mm. in Indonesia. And I was like, I'm going home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and it's like, dude, the, the things that turned into this next thing, turned into this next thing, but it also gave me the space and time to like build, think unbroken to what it is today Yeah, to help coach more people to write the books, to mm. start the podcast. I couldn't do anything else. So I'm just, I'm sitting under a desk with like a hand recorder with my knee and one of the, you know, these things, yeah. the ankle to the thigh brace. Yeah. I'm in this guy I started the first podcast right then. That was almost five years ago. Yeah. You know? And so I, I think I try to go back to that frequently, man. It's like life is life's not against you, but you got to pay attention to the signs. Well, I think too, like you, you did, you did something that a lot of people don't think of and that's pivot. Yeah. You know, like, like it, it puzzles me. Like I see so many people have something bad, like they have something bad happen to them. I like guess what? Like we're all dealt a bad hand at some point in time, every single yeah. person, you know? And so like, I, I'm not a big, even though I've used them, I'm not a big, uh, advocate of excuses you know <laughs> like it. It, they're easy to use but i've even i've even used them and like step back and be like you know what accountability i shouldn't have, i i need to do this this and this but guess what like everybody has something going on in their own life that is not up to par like that's like it sucks but that's part of the plan because if you didn't have that you wouldn't get better, yes. you know? So like, what are you going to do to take the effort to get better? Right. Yeah. And so like, like that makes me happy hearing you like, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck to a chair. I can't freaking go do anything. It's like, guess what? There's people that need to hear my message. Yeah. And so you got behind the mic, you got behind the pencil, you like, you started doing some stuff. And I think that's a huge, uh, a huge, um, lesson that people need to, take in and take to heart is everybody has the ability to do what we're doing. Yeah. It's just like, you got to take the step. What in are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah. I love that. You said no excuses. Anyone who's listened to this show for any period of time knows I live by one, one moniker, no excuses, just results. Yeah. Josie, when, when I'll tell you what my life looked like when it was full of excuses and I'll show you what my life looks like today. And I promise it's not the same thing. Yeah. You know, and, and speaking of, you know, you're doing something really beautiful in the world right now. Your, your, your background, it's funny, life's happening for you, has yeah. led you to this place where you're creating impact that's going to change America. And I know we're almost out of time, but I, I really want to talk about this. Tell me about the initiatives you have with Grant and Brandon and what you're trying to do for American farmers. This is something I believe in so much. This is a huge reason why I wanted you on the show, not only because you're an amazing human, but because we're, we're living in a world right now in this country where people who are in these rural communities mm -hmm. who are the backbone of America in a lot of ways, they, they make our food, they make our clothing, they give our produce. They're getting, they're getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. And you're on a mission to help change that because you're pivoting. Absolutely. You know, uh, I got involved with, uh, Grant and Brandon. Um, with Cardone Ventures uh, two and a half years ago with my own business to really learn how to grow and scale it. Um, I really dove in and just put my whole uh, life in order with that and uh, put everything on the line with them. And the results are astronomical. With that being said, I've implemented everything that I've learned there. And it's it's done wonders for our business. I've became part of the inner circle with Brandon and, um, you know, ultimately Grant. Um, you know, Grant and Brandon are actually helped me buy the business from my parents. My, my parents started the business, um, you know, 22 years later, I buy it from them. They said they're never going to sell it and, uh, they, I'd get it when they died, but that's not the way we wanted things. Like I wanted them to be comfortable 
Brandon helped lay that pathway out and actually get the business bought. And I ultimately wanted to be partners with Brandon and Grant because they're doing such great things in a, you know, in the world today. And they're so knowledgeable about growing and scaling business. I feel like we have something that it needs to be shared with the world because we not only change lives, we save lives with silver lining herbs. You know, we're our bread and butters in the horse industry, but we also have a dog line and a human line, both. And, uh, herbal medicine is, is awesome. But with that being said, when I went into a partnership with them, I told Brandon, I was sitting in his office in Scottsdale. I said, Brandon, I said, there's a group of people in America and North America that need to hear this message. And he said, what's that? And I says, it's rural America. I said, it's your farmers, your ranchers, your rural America people, um, the cowboy industry, they don't know how to, they don't know the logistics of growing and scaling a business, the nuts and bolts of systems, processes, data collection, everything that, that safeguards them into growing and scaling their business and, and really gives them a voice in, in today's community. We've been taught as a whole because I'm, I've was raised in rural America. I, I mean, yesterday I was leaving to come down to fly down here. And, you know, I left the office. I mean, I'm, I'm working in the office all the time now, but I still have a bunch of horses at home that I left in the barn. And I was like, man, I called my farmer out there, uh, south of town. I'm going out there to pick hay up so that I have more hay. So my kids could feed while I'm gone. Like, this is like, I'm, my kids are still working in this. I live in rural America. This is, this is your life. This is my life. The polar opposite of mine, by the way. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> um, so anyways, um, he says, he says, yeah, he says, I, I, I believe that he says, uh, he says, well, let's start a vertical. And so we started that we launched this vertical called 10 X farm and ranch. And yes, it's called 10 X farm and ranch. It it's, it's to help farmers and ranchers in the industry, but it's also any, there's so many connected businesses inside the farm and ranch industry. It could be Western wear stores. It could be farm and ranch apparel stores. It could be, you know, tractor implement companies. It could be logistic companies. It could be, you know, anything inside rural America. But I said, there's so many big companies evolving, whether it be your big tech companies or whether it be companies from across sea, your Chinese companies, they're all coming and they're buying this land up because you have all these farmers and ranchers that have these big, um, legacy properties, farm, farm, uh, properties, ranch properties that have been in the families for generations. And now the younger generation don't really have, uh, Either they've never been taught or there's no pathway painted for them to take it over. And they're selling out to these big tech companies or, uh, big, uh, you know, uh, companies overseas or whatever. And it's like, listen, people, they're not making any more land. We said this earlier, I, they're, they're not making any more land. You can only develop so much land before you run out of farmland and ranching land in this country. And I'm going to tell you what, if you... If you put your farming and your ranching and depend on that on other countries to import into this country, now they dictate you. We have to keep our farming and our ranching going here in America, or we're going to be controlled by another country. And that is important to me. And this, you know, Grant and Brandon talk about collaboration as a new currency. I have collaborated with them because they have a big mouth piece. They reach a lot of people. And not only that, but I, I truly believe everything that they say and I've implemented it in my own business and it works like wonders. It's done, it's changed my life. It's changed my company's uh, future, everything. And so I, I'm like, dude, we got to implement this into, into this rural America industry because it, it is so crucial. We can't be, people can't survive off lab processed meat. Yeah. It's not healthy. I, I agree. And that's, that's a rabbit hole. We, we have to save for another conversation, yeah. but I, I fully agree. And I've had some of the top experts in health in the world mm. on this show. And they all talk about one thing being more important than probably almost anything else when it comes to your mental health. And that is the food you put in your body. Yeah, And so I, I see this pivot that yet again, another pivot, an opportunity in front of you to, 100%. to face the fear of climbing a Mount Everest here and just saying, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And I think the intention 
your word for the day mm -hmm. that you're using to help in a lot of ways, save this country, but in, in a lot of other ways to help save the livelihoods of the American people. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I always hope to do with this show is to give people tools to help them understand other possibilities, to change their mindset, to go and do the scary thing, to maybe not ride the horse again after you break your yeah. pelvis, but what, what can you do to continue to push yourself forward towards the life that you want to create? And, you know, man, your, your story and your mission are, are powerful. Um, I appreciate you greatly. And, you know, before I ask you my last question, do me a favor and tell everyone where they can find you and learn more about your mission. Yeah. So, um, my, my main company is called, uh, silver lining herbs and, uh, our website there is silverliningherbs.com. Herbs is plural. And then, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Josie young 82. That's J O S I young Y O U N G 82. And also Facebook. Um, yeah, man, just, just keep following. I'm going to keep promoting what we do. Um, I urge people to look where their food comes from. Um, I urge people to, you know, like, I don't expect people to really, um, you know, dive in, uh, deep on that, but just, just have an awareness of that. And I just want to encourage the farmers, ranchers, rural America to get involved in, in really knowing more about growing and scaling their business, because you can leverage, you can leverage the other side. If you know more about the more, the more you learn, the more you earn. Yeah. And that applies here too. And that's why, you know, I, I give people information from different data sources, mm -hmm. your, your failures, I hope become data sources for others to step into their successes yeah. for them to win. And even sitting here next to you, your, your intensity and your presence is felt. And, and I, I love that, you know, you and I got to connect and I, I believe this firmly, the universe helps you find people who are in alignment with you based on your energy and your purpose. And, and I feel that with you, my friend. So I'm happy to be able to, to share your story, your journey and, and promote what you're trying to do to help make this, this country incredible and sustainable because mm -hmm. I do not want to, I'm going to just plant my flag. Now I do not want to eat processed meat. <laughs> I don't, I will not do it. I, I don't believe in it, but that's, you, you, I'm going to get canceled. Hey, so I'm going to stop You're there. in my inner circle. You come to my house and you can enjoy beef with me. I'll always be raising my own beef. We need to have a steak together, brother. Yeah. My last question for you. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? Yeah, man, this is, uh, this is something that I've kind of lived by my whole life. You know, um, you're not broken until you're dead. You're just not, I, they can like, I've been, I've been physically broken on every aspect. I mean, I've got a rap sheet uh, when I go into the, when I go in to get physical exams at a doctor I've never been to before, like I can't fill up the papers fast enough, you know? So no matter what happens in your life, you know, like get a grasp on your inner feelings, get a grasp on your mental clarity and really have a path of where you want to go. Be intentional about where you want to go. That's something I always come back to zero on is like, Hey, what is my intention for this? And, uh, it's a, it's a nonstop for me as well. And no matter what happens in this world, no matter how bad your struggles are, no matter what, uh, things you break, no matter what feelings get hurt, you're never unbroken until God calls you back. Mm. Beautifully keep, said, my friend. Keep going, man. I love that. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. To find out more about Josie, go to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. All of his links will be in there as well as information on his podcast. Go to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And remember, when you share this information, you're moving us closer and further and ending generational trauma, helping people transform trauma into triumph, breakdowns to breakthroughs, and to become the hero of their own story. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see you.